Welcome to the Dingia Zone. Hi, I'm Victor, and today I'm going to talk about DNA and this thing called microevolution versus macroevolution. Um, what is that? Uh, well, if we look around us in the world, we see a lot of different species, you know, like uh, whatever elephants, giraffes, dogs, cats, whatever. And uh, here there's a lot of diversity between these species. And the question is, why is that? Where does that come from? And um, yeah, biology, uh, Charles Darwin in particular, um, found the mechanism that produces this diversity called evolution. But if that's how uh, all the different species came about, then 6,000 years wouldn't be enough to produce all these species, right? So then uh, the account in the Bible, the Genesis account is wrong. And uh, yeah, then there wouldn't be some Adam and Eve at the beginning when everything, all, all the different species were put here by God, right? And um, well, if there is no Adam and Eve, then there is no original sin. And without original sin, there's no need for a savior, no need for a messiah called Jesus who was crucified for our sins. And uh, yeah, then the, the churches around the world have nothing to sell, right? They sell uh, redemption, right? And yeah, without original sin, there is no need for redemption. So of course, uh, churches are very, very, very against evolution. Um, and in particular, the so-called creationists insist that uh, God made this all and uh, evolution doesn't even work. But even creationists have to admit that a little bit of evolution exists, right? They call that microevolution, which at least explains all the different races within one species, right? The, uh, all the different kinds of dogs, for example. You couldn't have all these uh, kinds of dogs all on Noah's Ark, right? Although we've talked about Noah's Ark, that's a different story. Watch that video. Um, yeah, the, uh, but, but creationists um, still have to admit that a little bit of evolution exists, right? So the different races come from this so-called microevolution, what they call microevolution. And um, yeah, they justify that with the word kind that you find in the story of Noah's Ark. And um, yeah, they refuse to correctly specify what that word even means. But uh, yeah, that's a different story. I've made a video about that also. Watch that also. Um, yeah, so, uh, so this whole question, is there this difference between microevolution and macroevolution? Namely, is there really this uh, distinction between microevolution and macroevolution? So is there microevolution that allows um, yeah, beings from one species to change over time into yeah, beings of a different race, but within the same species? And um, yeah, that's what they will admit. Um, but they say that uh, from one species, you cannot go to a different species. Like, two dogs breeding will always produce a dog. So that's their argument. And yeah, as a mathematician, I've uh, wanted to look at that mathematically. So the first thing I had to do uh, was to model this situation mathematically. Okay. And well, I'm not a biologist, so I don't have that much uh, understanding of DNA. So I first had to look a little bit into DNA. Um, we don't have to go very deep into it. Just a few uh, things here uh, will be sufficient. Well, deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, um, is this thing we all know from Jurassic Park, right? Where you have this uh, nice double helix here, where, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a twisted ladder, right? You, if you untwisted that, thing, you would get this ladder-like structure with these uh, rungs here in between, right? And, well, um, 
these rungs are really the only interesting thing for us. Um, these rungs uh, always have two sides and these are called base pairs. Um, each side is a so-called nucleobasis. Okay, and this basis, two of them give you a base pair and that's one rung. Okay, and uh, yeah, every rung um, has on one side uh, one of four nucleobases, um, cytosine, guanine, adenine or thymine. And yeah, th this is then represented as this A, T, G and C. Um, and everything else is just, yeah, let's say glue. Okay, everything else is just there to hold this together. The really important thing are these uh, nucleobases here. And um, yeah, you can uh, represent them uh, using A's, C's, G's and T's. Um, so the entirety of, uh, of such a DNA uh, sequence can be represented as a long string, a long text string containing A's, C's, G's and T's, right? Um, but that's just a representation, right? This is, uh, this is not actual code uh, that you could, uh, I don't know, you, you probably could uh, actually build something like a reader for that so that you could uh, read that in a computer, I don't know, but um, like, a, like a, a storage device. Um, but yeah, the important thing is uh, that you have these four different nucleobases here. Uh, this is a T, this is an A, a C and a G. And um, yeah, what uh, you can see here is uh, T and A have um, these two connections here and C and G have these three connections. So, so that's an important thing that uh, C and G at attract each other and T and A also attract each other. So uh, in this double helix, uh, the opposite of a T will always be an A. The opposite of an A will always be a T. The opposite of a C will always be a G and the opposite of a G will always be a C. So these are complementary to each other. Now, um, how does DNA replication work? Um, there's a really good video here on YouTube by a channel called Your Genome. And um, here you see this, uh, such an untwisted uh, DNA sequence. And um, yeah, it shows here how this thing called a helicase splits this double helix into two halves, okay? And yeah, then basically both halves are then reconstructed. Okay, so they, um, uh, so they uh, go into uh, such a thing called a polymerase, which um, yeah, there due to the attraction of C and G and A and T will just fill in the other sides of this thing. Okay, so uh, this basically repairs one half of the um, double helix and well for the other half there's a different uh, mechanism that's a bit more complicated but we don't need to go that deep into it. Basically uh, the double helix is split into two parts and then both sides are repaired. That's uh, the basic idea and that's how this DNA replication works. Now that's not really what I would call intelligent design to copy something by ripping it apart and then repairing both halves. I think a, a perfect uh, god designing this mechanism would have come up with something better, uh, something less invasive I would say. Um, but the thing is that this copying mechanism isn't 100% perfect. Um, so when you copy your uh, DNA, then the copy you get out can have slight differences. Okay. And uh, that is what we call mutations, right? Uh, you have uh, one DNA and then you make a copy of it, but there's a slight difference in the copy. So if the, if the copy isn't 100% a copy, you can call that an error. 
And then some people like Kent Hovind say, well, errors cannot improve something, uh, which yeah, is wrong. I mean, if the copying mechanism uh, accidentally fixes a mistake, then this copying error, that is an error from the perspective of the, of the copying mechanism, because it, it didn't make a 100% copy, it can still improve the thing uh, because the output can be better than the input. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, these slight differences are then called mutations and um, they are the reason for, uh, for evolution. Like uh, every generation you will have more and more little changes and well, if these changes are beneficial, then it improves the uh, chances of survival. So uh, the chances of survival, also called natural selection, then filter out um, the changes that uh, are harmful and uh, select the beneficial changes just by uh, the beneficial changes having better chances of survival. Now, if I remember correctly, then there was something like uh, 300 changes between one generation to the next. Um, but I'm not sure if that was actually the number and it doesn't even matter because uh, we won't even need that many changes for my argument here. Okay, so now let's uh, think about this uh, microevolution and macroevolution. Now, as a mathematician, I modeled this in a mathematical way using a graph theoretical graph. Um, typically, you call your graphs G, and they consist of two elements, a set of vertices and a set of edges. Yeah, the vertices that I'm using is just every possible sequence of A's, C's, G's, and T's of any length, any possible sequence. Okay. Um, so basically this is all, all possible DNA strands will be my vertices and the edges between the vertices um, I specify as uh, you have an edge between two DNA strands if the Levenstein distance between the string representation is less than 300. Okay, because we can have 300 changes per generation. And uh, so basically this says uh, two uh, pieces of DNA are connected if one of them can evolve into the other one within one generation. Okay, so uh, if you have one uh, DNA strand X, then you can look at its neighborhood to see which um, other DNA strands Y could be produced by that X. Okay. Um, I don't know, maybe even 310 or something might even be possible in some circumstances, but whatever. Um, again, we don't need even more than six here, but uh, for reality sake, I've put 300 here, but we, we won't even need that much. Um, okay. Now, why did I use the Levenstein distance here? Um, well, look at these two sequences here, AC, 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 and so on, and CA, 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 and so on. These are quite similar sequences, right? Um, because if you just add another C in front and remove the final C, that's not a big difference, right? You can turn this sequence into this with only two small changes, adding a C here, removing a C here, right? And that's actually something that, um, um, that the DNA copying mechanism is able to do. It can insert things into the sequence. I think especially the second, um, uh, in, the, in that video I've showed you the second um, part of the copying mechanism, I think is more error prone, but uh, whatever. The thing is that adding something or removing something isn't a big change from the perspective of uh, the DNA copying, right? And the Levenstein distance captures that because in Levenstein, insertions are just small steps. They are only counted as small steps. So adding this initial C and removing the final C, that's just two small changes that are both 
within uh, the reach of um, of the DNA copying mechanism. And uh, yeah, since these are just small uh, differences, the distance between these two uh, sequences shouldn't be big. So they should be uh, close to each other in our graph. And yeah, the Levenstein distance uh, does that by assigning them a distance of only two. So it gives us a 90% match. Um, and that's actually the thing that, uh, that Jeffrey Tompkins did wrong. Um, there's a pretty good video on this topic uh, on the channel of Gutzik Gibbon, um, where she discusses um, this claim by Jeffrey Tompkins, who said that yeah, humans and chimpanzees only had uh, 70 to 89 percent the same DNA, uh, when in reality it's 98.8 percent. So it's really close. And yeah, creationist Jeffrey Tompkins said it was only 70 uh, to 89 percent. But um, the mistake that uh, Tompkins made is he used the Hemming distance instead. And the Hemming distance is really, really fragile when it comes to insertions, because Hemming distance just compares character for character. Is it the same character? right? And, uh, and uh, if you insert something, then this can really throw uh, the Hemming distance off. right? Here, this uh, initial sequence here, AC, 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 compared to C, A, C, A, C, A, uh, has a Hemming distance of 20, like this is a this is a zero percent match because every character is different here. A is not C, C is not A, A is not C, and so on. So you would have a Hamming distance of 20, uh, meaning that you have a zero percent match here. And that's what uh, what Tompkins used to compare uh, human and chimpanzee DNA. Okay, so the graph that I've designed would look something like this. You would have somewhere as a sequence A, 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 A. And then this would be connected to everything that has a, Leven a, a small Levenstein distance. Like here, I only depicted Levenstein distance one, I think. Um, so if we only replace the first character with a C, that's Levenstein distance one, second character, third character replaced with a C, first character replaced with a T. Okay, the, these are all connected to my a, 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 A. But uh, yeah, between T and C, there's all, also only a, dif a difference of one, namely this T has turned into a C. Or down here, this third A has turned into a C, so this is also connected. And uh, this A, A, C, A, A, A is connected to C, A, C, A, 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 because it uh, only differs in this first character, C versus A. And uh, to this one, it uh, only differs in the third position. Uh, there it's only a C instead of an A. And uh, yeah. Okay, I think the idea is clear. So uh, we are building kind of like a map of all the possible transitions between generations, right? And the question now is from where can we go where? Um, now, the creationist idea, of course, is to say, well, you have the DNA of a dog and reachable from that, you would only have other dogs, right? That, uh, and and uh, the DNA of a cat, for example, would be somewhere completely different. Uh, and from there, you could only reach other cats, right? That, that would be then microevolution that in this graph, you can walk from cat to some something very much like a, also a cat, a different cat, right? Uh, a Persian cat to, I don't know, I, I don't know many, many cat uh, races, but, um, but that's, that's the whole idea in this microevolution thing, right? You, you have dogs and cats and everything reachable from them, but these would be distinct things, right? You can never go from dog to cat. And um, yeah, for simplicity's sake, um, I'm now representing uh, the DNA sequence for a dog just by the word dog. Of course, D and O are not actual nucleobases, okay? Just uh, 
bear with me. Um, I'm just pretending they are. And the word dog is a DNA sequence that produces a dog, right? And the word cat is a DNA sequence that produces a cat. And we can just uh, uh, change every letter step by step, right? From uh, dog, we go to cock, right? We just switch the first character. That would be a valid step in our graph. Um, then from cock, we go to cac. That's also a valid step in our graph. We just changed the second character from O to A. That even still works with Hamming distance, by the way. Um, but uh, yeah, then we do the last step, replacing this G with a T. Okay, and, and that way we can go from the DNA of a dog to the DNA of a cat by just replacing the, the dog DNA character for character by a cat DNA and every step in between is a step that would be possible in our graph. But here's the problem. What if CAG isn't a thing, right? If, if CAG is uh, something that wouldn't even be viable, right? Something that uh, wouldn't survive uh, to the age of procreation. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's a problem in this argument, right? So this just going, just going step by step doesn't necessarily work. Okay, that's, that's the important thing. And that's actually the basis of this whole uh, uh, microevolution versus macroevolution thing that, uh, yeah, the, the claim of the creationist is that every path from dog to cat would at some point uh, cross something that isn't viable. So the, the, the things reachable by dog and the things reachable by cat would have to be different things uh, so they, they would have to be different connected components to use a, a graph theoretical word for it. Um, so even if you had something like uh, the other way, D-O-T, D-A-T, C-A-T, uh, would be a different path from dog to cat, but maybe that also has one not viable sequence in between. And that's the question. That's basically the claim between uh, microevolution and macroevolution. You know, saying that microevolution exists but macroevolution doesn't is basically this one claim that every path from dog to cat must cross something that isn't viable, right? So there is no path from dog to cat. Everything that I might try in my graph would have to fail. It would have to cross something that isn't there. Okay, so in so in the graph, you could um, represent that as we are talking about the vertices again, as all sequences of A, C, G, and T um, of any length, but we re remove everything that's not viable. Okay. However, we, de we define that. I don't think we can find it out, but, um, but we have to keep that in mind that um, this idea might not work. And yeah, again, the claim of the creationists is that removing the unviable nodes, vertices, uh, makes the graph disconnected, right? They say then after removing the stuff that's not viable, uh, there just is no path left from dog to cat, right? That's what they are saying. There is no path from dog to cat. Okay, now let's uh, try to find one path. So we start with a dog and we want to get over here to cat. Okay, the blue area is uh, everything that's reachable uh, from the dog DNA sequence and the yellow area is uh, everything reachable from the cat DNA. Okay, now uh, let's try to find a way from dog to cat that in which every single step is viable. Now, the first thing we can do is we can append a G, T, A, and G. Why would we do that? Well, because G, T is like uh, something in programming, uh, the start of a comment. So when you have a G, T, then the, the protein production um, will just uh, stop outputting at this point when you uh, have a G, T in your DNA sequence. And 
yeah, when you have an AG, then it uh, starts producing again. Okay, this is very much like a comment in uh, programming. So from doc, we can just append that. And by appending that, we haven't changed anything, right? So we have a doc and then start of comment, end of comment. Okay, this start of comment, end of comment would just be ignored uh, by the production. So this would still produce a dog. And since dogs are viable, this is still a viable DNA sequence. Now we insert a C in between. And uh, notice this is just uh, for a, a, a distance of four here in our graph. So uh, adding G, T, A, and G is completely fine. Okay, uh, this, uh, the Levenstein distance here is only four. That's well within our 300 uh, that we allowed. Then uh, we insert a C. Uh, that's again, Levenstein distance one. We can do that. Uh, this is now still a viable DNA sequence because it still produces a dog and everything after it is just ignored. Then we can insert an A, okay? This again is viable. It produces a dog and then ignores the CA after it. And then we insert a T and this is again still viable because it produces a dog, which is viable, and then ignores this GT cat AG. Okay, now we make a bit of a bigger step over here. Um, we add a GT in front of the dog, replace the GT in between with an AG, and remove the uh, final AG. Okay, these are only six changes, right? The appending a GT in front, removing this GT and replacing it with AG is uh, two uh, steps, and removing this final AG is also two steps, so we have only six steps well within our 300 that we uh, used as a cutoff. And yeah, now look at that. We now have something that ignores the DNA sequence of a dog and then produces a cat, right? And uh, yeah, this again is viable because cats are viable. So this is again a viable DNA sequence that produces a living cat. And I think you can already see where we are going now. Now we uh, uh, remove the G, uh, the O, the D, and then we remove the GTAG and we have reached the cat. Okay, so, so yeah, what we see here now is a path from dog to cat where every step is only has a Levenstein distance of, of uh, six at most and every vertex in between is viable okay they are all there they are they exist in our graph they are not removed by this removing unviable dna sequences okay and um, yeah this really answers the question that um, is there still a path from dog to cat yes after removing the unviable things there is still a path from dog to cat. So um, I'm not saying that this is a good path, right? I mean, this is uh, quite convoluted um, and it's quite um, unlikely that uh, the, the path between dog and cat would go this uh, complicated path. But uh, the thing is, there is a path, right? And if there is one path, then the creationists cannot prove there is no path. Right? And if uh, they cannot show that there is no path, then this whole idea of these islands, the dog island, the cat island, it's just wrong. There, there are no islands. These kinds don't exist. Right? If you define the kind as the limit of uh, where you can go from a dog and the limit uh, to where you can go from a cat, there is no such limit. You can go from any viable being to any other viable being. Right? You can do this trick from any uh, living thing there is to any other living thing there is or ever was or pos potentially can ever be. Right? So, uh, so in terms of uh, graph theory, 
uh, this graph here is connected. Uh, kappa, the uh, number of connected components is one. So there is a pass from any viable being to any other viable being, right? These, these islands, these kinds are complete nonsense. Uh, this is not an actual thing. Uh, the graph covers everything uh, that is viable and everything is reachable from everything else. So yeah, that's uh, what I wanted to show you today. I think this argument really makes sense. And um, yeah, it completely disproves this whole creationist uh, claim of microevolution versus macroevolution. It's not, it's not a thing. Microevolution is macroevolution and you don't need different words for it. It's just evolution. So yeah, if you like this video, like it, share it, subscribe, and see you next time.